Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Gospel of St. Mark, the 11th chapter. We all know the story one time when Jesus walks to a fig tree and uh, he wants to eat because he's hungry. And the Bible says he saw leaves on it, but there was no fruit. And because of that, he cursed it and said, no man shall eat of thee. He moved on and then did whatever he was supposed to do overnight. And the next day, they're coming back through the same road. And you all know the story. Peter realizes that the fig tree had dried up from the roots. And he says, Master, look for the tree that you cast has dried up and withered from the root." And when he did that, Jesus tells him, have faith in God. That's what he tells his disciples. So have the God kind of faith. Just not just faith in God, but the literal translation is the God kind of faith. Somebody say amen. Now the Bible says, and where I want us to lay emphasis on in the 23rd verse, he says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, then he shall have whatsoever he saith. Praise the Lord. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And he says, and therefore I say unto you that whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Somebody shout amen. amen. Now, in the ministry of faith, in this line of ministry of faith, many faith ministers, many faith preachers, Fanero and all the rest, who preach faith, who are literal crazy faith people. And I have read books of men who have done crazy faith great faith. I'm not just talking about healing flus, no. I'm talking about stuff that will marvel you. Many a time when we're teaching about the faith, the mystery, the spirit of faith, the demystification of this uh, mystery called faith, many times we lay emphasis on the saying, okay? And indeed, like in that verse 23, the word say alone, the confession, the word of confession is mentioned three times, and rightly so, we are allowed to emphasize that because it is emphasized in scripture. He says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. The Bible says, then he shall have whatsoever he saith. So it's not wrong for us to emphasize saying and confession because the Bible emphasizes saying and confession. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yes. And I tell people, we could never emphasize enough the power of confession. It marvels me that even after all of this teaching, some of our believers in the faith have not yet understood the power of confession. You understand? A couple of years ago, I met somebody who was diagnosed with a terminal illness, cancer and they were given weeks and months to leave and I prayed with them and immediately the cancer left their body terminal terminal they had a short time to heal and terminal cancer healed cleared out of the body they go to the doctors and they check them and they say that you do not have cancer not even a trace of it what happened they start asking questions after that, this person lived a good life, one year, two, three years, four. They lived a very comfortable life, healed. They were healed, totally, totally. And then, one time I met this particular individual, a couple of years after we had even buried the story of cancer, 
and they were confessing some things that were so negative about their lives. And you know, when you function in the prophetic, I can't say I'm in the office of the prophet, but I am a prophetic apostle. Huh? So sometimes there is a nudge of the spirit that comes out of you because of a certain understanding that you have. And you find that you cannot hold back certain warnings spiritually. But because sometimes we give these warnings in the most humble tone, some people do not understand the intensity of those words. And I tell people, when you are around a man who you know he has God, be careful when God is speaking to you through them. Because in certain conversations, some conversations seem so simple and mild that you might not pick the voice of God, yet God is speaking to you in the deepest way that he would ever minister to you. So I remember sitting this person down and said, you know what, my spirit has told me. What I did not tell them was I saw by the spirit, I saw them die. And I could not tell them that I see you die. Because it was not easy for me to confess that. But I remember sitting this dear woman down and I told her, you know my friend, my spirit cannot help to tell you that you confess so negatively. Stop confessing negatively about yourself. She said, oh no, Apostle, no, these things are not serious. Sometimes I be joking. And I told her, look, in the spirit realm, there are no jokes. You can't joke in the spirit because Satan does not joke. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. If the joke is cosy, if the joke is negative, then I want you to understand that you are establishing the full extent of that thing spiritually. Because remember, there is power in a confession that finds a merry heart. Some people confess jokingly, and they do not know the power of the words that they are speaking. And I tell people, even jokingly, do not confess certain things. Exercise yourself not to confess certain things over your life regardless of what is happening around you. I wonder the first time. Again, I met her one day and she was narrating a story. She forgot we had this conversation. And this time I rebuked her sternly, but respectfully. And I said, look, dear woman, your confessions are too much. Stop confessing negatively. There are people who are so attuned to negative confession that it so naturally happens out of them and they do not even know that they are confessing negatively. Some of you, you're coming out of cars and then you say, Oh my God, I've grown old. And the person speaking that is 40. But they're struggling to come out of a car at 40. You have pronounced weakness in your bones at the age of 40. You're telling your bones that at the age of 40, I'm not able to get up. Are you hearing me? You understand what I'm saying? Oh, I'm so old. You're so old? What do you mean by you're so old? Yeah? Somebody is 32 and they're working like this. Apostle. Confession. Confession. And then about one year before she died, it was a July date. I was sleeping in the bed and the Lord told me that a disease is going to hit this woman and she's going to die in a space of one year. I called her and I sat her down and I told her something is going to come to afflict your body. But if we don't beat it, I'm afraid of the consequences of its end. It was a July date, I remember very well. And I called this person and I told them, God has told me if we don't deal with something in this period, some disease is going to come. And indeed, after about four or five months after that conversation, something strikes her body. And when it does, she goes back into the old confessions that I had warned her about. And I loved this person dearly. 
And I remember walking to the hospital bed one time at night, and I knelt, I said, God, heal. I interceded for some minutes, and I spoke in tongues for this person for some minutes, and the Lord told me, there is no kind of prayer you can have for her because she has planted a lot of words in the spirit realm and you cannot undo them now. And I said, God, but you are a healer. I believe in your healing. Yes, he said. But he says, but she even herself does not believe that she's going to walk off that bed. Her heart was defiled in unbelief. And she died. She died. A very young age, she died. She died. Some people don't know that the difference between your life and death is in your confession. It's in your confession. I can never emphasize this enough. Don't confess negatively on your life. Don't. Don't ever let anybody confess negatively over your life. Even if it's your parent and they say you're going to fail, say in the name of Jesus, I will not fail. Let them beat you for refusing to confess negatively, but never take those words in. Because Satan can even use your spouse, even your own parent, to pronounce anathema over you, to curse your destiny. Refuse negative words. If you don't want your father to hear you and you know he'll smite you, speak it under the breath of your voice. They say you're going to fail. You say in your heart, I refuse to fail. You will not see good in this life. You say it in a way they will not hear, but the devil should hear. Jesus Christ, the devil Stop, 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 stop. What are you doing? Nothing. But you at least do it. Me, the moment something is spoken on my life and it is negative, eh? if the person is older than me and I will not have war with them, I'll just say, no. <clears throat> if they're in the realm, I can I say, eh, no, that one, no, not over me, not over my life, not over my children, not over the ministry, not over anything. Refuse negative words around you. Refuse to sit around negative energy. Oh, muse, look at you. Do you think this will happen on you? Mm -mm. Refuse, refuse. Refuse on them under your breath. You understand? Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. And likewise, again, if you learn to confess positively on your life, you will produce the results of your positive confession. Somebody shout hallelujah. But even though we are emphasizing this, many times we miss out on the issue of the heart. Okay? He says, For verily I send to you that whosoever shall say, which is good now, many of you have learned the confession art, you sometimes even confess negatively alone, but sometimes you now learn to confess when you're around the people who hold you accountable. Eh? When you're around the Christian, you just find yourself changing. I'm going to fail. Manya, manya, I'm not failing. You understand? So you're still struggling in your head. But, but you see, he said, yes, okay. Now that you are learning or have learned to confess right, he adds something here, which many preachers don't touch, but is important. He says, and shall not doubt in his heart. Shall not doubt in his heart. The Greek word there for doubt is diakrino, meaning to separate oneself from the confession that they are making. Meaning some people separate themselves with a hostile spirit. They show hostility against the word of God or against their confession. Many, many people's hearts are opposed to the confession that they are making. Many people's hearts strive and dispute against their confession. They contend against their confession. They are at variance against their confession in a deep, sleepless sense. 
to hold a different opinion in your heart from the confession you are making. Some people hold a different opinion in their heart from the confession that they are making. If you hold a different opinion from your heart from the confession that you are making, it means that you are doubting in your heart. And here, the Greek word for heart connects or deals or it means the soul. It relates to the soul. It denotes the soul, the soulish realm. And what is the soulish realm? The soulish realm is the fountain and seat of your thoughts, number one, your emotions, your passions, your desires, your appetites, your affections, and your purposes. Seven things. That's the fountain, the seat. That means from your soul comes your feelings, right? The thoughts, the passion, comes your purposes. It comes your appetites, comes your desires. It comes everything, comes from the soulish realm. And he's saying if you're doubting in your heart, it means you doubt with your soul, okay? And so to help your soul, I want to teach you how not to doubt in your heart. You understand? I want to teach you how not to doubt in your heart. What to do, how to practice in the spirit so that you learn not to doubt in your heart. What it means to master. Mastery has seven dimensions. The seven dimensions of mastery. And of the seven dimensions, four of them are personal. The three are for the world. When you learn to walk in all the seven dimensions of mastery. Okay, the Bible says we which master, we must strive lawfully. When you are striving for mastery, you master lawfully. There are principles, there are patterns, there are levels of understanding that come to you. And when you do know those levels, then you are master. You master your life. Okay, you master your life. And when you carry mastery, it means your results are not coincidental. Your results are not lack. Your results are not circumstantial. Your results are calculatable. They are deliberate. They are predictable. They are determined. Okay? There are people in this world who when they pray and answers come, they are shocked. Even their testimonies, oh my God, I prayed. And you know what? It just happened. You understand? And there are people who if it did not happen, they will be so shocked. That's mastery. Mastery is convinced of its results. You're convinced. You know that 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 it will work. Somebody shout hallelujah. You know that it will work. That's mastery. When you are in the realm of mastery, you are convinced. You are convinced. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so... The four are individual. These are things you do for you. And the three are outward. Can you imagine? That means the biggest percentage of mastery is self. When you learn to master self, you will learn to master the world outside you. The world of tenth. The physical realm. The world outside. When you learn these dimensions, mastery will be easy for you. You will know how to deal. I'll give you an example. For example, the seat. They're talking about appetites and stuff like that. I was telling somebody one day and I told him, look, one of the most fundamental places of mastery for the individual begins with food. If you cannot master how much food you eat, you can't master yourself in any other way. Because of all the things that enter your body, there is nothing that is as friendly as food because food is friendly. It's like your friend. It's, the, it's like the one thing that has never hurt you. Has food ever disappointed you? Good food? Have you ever been so disappointed that I ate very nice food? I'm so disappointed. Curry is so nice. No, it's like your friend. That's why people who are stressed and depressed eat a lot. Because it's the one thing that seems to understand them. 
Have you noticed that when people join this ministry, they lose weight? Have you noticed that many of you, when you joined this ministry, you started losing weight? Why? Because there's something the Spirit does on your life. You understand what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to say here is when we're talking about the mastery, if you are someone here and your eating cannot be controlled, you are in trouble. Because chances are you'll never be able to master anything. You'll never be able to master anything. And I speak this in love. I hope you understand me. I asked one time somebody says, we put a 40 day fast. Did you fast? Ha <laughs> also. As in leave me up also. I know myself. You understand? You must be able to know that this portion is enough for me. And I refuse to eat more. Some of you are not doing it to yourself. You're doing it to your children. These days, kids eat food. One time I went to an international school. I'd gone to see somebody in an international school. And I found a young boy. He probably was about seven or eight. And he could not walk. And I asked the teacher and I said, how can you keep this kind of kid like this? Are you helping this kid? And the teacher told me, Apostle, it's what the parents pack for their boy. They pack for the boy. He's eating every time. And the boy is very young. He's like eight years. But he's... <laughs> eight. You don't love your children by feeding them abnormally. You're killing them. Because if they cannot control food, there is no other appetite and pleasure they will control. So don't blame your child when they get messed up one day. Because you didn't help them to know that this is enough for you. Don't ask for more. But what I'm trying to say, food is very spiritual. Very spiritual. Very, very spiritual. How you eat is very spiritual. And you cannot grow in spirituality when you eat uncontrollably. Some of you are small, but ha! You're small, but dangerous. Praise God. But we will see that mastery, when you understand mastery, it lightens your soul. And when it lightens your soul, it easily, easily gives way for your spirit man. It strengthens your inner man. Days of fasting. Some of you realize in the first weeks of fasting, your flesh is demanding everything. You understand? Those first weeks. But as you continue fasting, the flesh starts to give way. Isn't it? For the spirit. And so it is. Even after fasting, don't just go now and say, ah, party, or a little party. Then feast like a crazy thing. By two months, you're all looking like this. No. You understand what I'm saying? And not every big person eats a lot. Again, I insist, some small people are dangerous. <laughs> Praise God. But limit how you eat. It's one of those things that helps the soul. It helps your soul. Your body, but your soul. It helps you. Praise God. And for me, when I learned that years ago, I stopped eating a certain way, regardless of how happy. I respect my temple. You understand what I'm saying? I don't just eat. No, 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 no. You understand what I'm saying? Because I need to speak in tongues. I need to pray a certain way. Are you hearing me? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, there's a reality that I need us to touch a bit because I think that in the faith circles, uh, when I read church history, I see that the church of Jesus is advancing into the maturation of that scripture, but I cannot say that we have matured there. I pray in my lifetime we see it, but... It's a hopeful prayer because of how far I see many of us are in the doctrine of faith. I wish 
one day we teach about the doctrine of faith as a doctrine so you understand what it means because many times we teach about faith but we need to teach it full circle so people understand the doctrine of faith okay and i believe this is one of those places that the church of jesus christ needs maturation in because many things have come in and convoluted and mixed up our faith and that is why we are a generation that hardly sees remarkable miracles we are a generation that hardly sees remarkable miracles and many churches now ministries are being built not entirely anymore the demonstration of power to a place of seeing remarkable miracles because they prefer to stand more in the realm of liberality and speak of a faith that might never work and speak every excuse of why the faith does not work and so every other day christianity is becoming a realm of political correctness than revelation and power and we refuse to build ministry in political correctness if god says he heals we believe in divine healing if god says he serves we believe in salvation and all of these things now the bible says for all somebody say all oh. the promises of god the bible says in him are what a year and in him amen and to the glory of god by us now that scripture is deep when the bible says that all the promises of god in him are yeah and in him amen it means that god says to you and me that we have legal rights to every promise that he gave us every right to every promise now we still have people who i believe are growing in the faith and have confessions such as you know god will not give you everything you believe sometimes god will say no because i believe there are areas in the doctrine of faith that we have failed to emphasize to teach to help people understand firstly how do you discern the voice of god and what is in the realm of all promises Do you understand what I'm saying? Of all promises. If God promised wealth, He will give you wealth. You must believe that you'll die a wealthy man. You must believe that you'll die a wealthy woman. Are you hearing me? That is regardless of how that money comes. That promise is not for people who have jobs. and you do not need to have a job to claim that promise because not all the richest people in the world have jobs you understand what i'm saying but when years evolve and things change you are poised to doubt god and ask how because every other year you have expectations and they're not fulfilled and you're growing old and you're growing weary and as you're growing weary you start to settle for the least because you think i think god is done with me men like smith wigglesworth started demonstrating power in their late 40s the maria old was etta started living life the history the etta's rights they write in their 50s so it's not about age no it's about what a man sees in the presence of god and so because of that we have people who give excuses oh like recently i had a man of god teaching he said it's false doctrine to say that christians cannot or should not fall sick no we can and could fall sick but there is a provision that we were healed and so we can pray it out that is his level of faith i refuse to sit there we are choosing to get into the maturation of that as a ministry and because we do for us in this ministry we believe that it is possible for a christian not to fall sick at all until the day you go to heaven jesus did it jesus did it when kennedy hagen left his bed of sickness he refused to ever fall sick again he died at 87 with no illness just sat in a chair and went to heaven it's possible it's possible tell your neighbor it is possible 
But some people, they like those lines of, you know, sometimes things might not work. But you stay believing. Uh -uh. They will always work. For all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Whether the devil wants it or not, you will make it. You have to believe that every day. Whether the devil believes it or not, woman of God, you will make it. I don't care whether you're going to be the first in your family. I don't care whether you are delayed. I don't care whether it has not worked before. That is none of my business. This is what I know for sure. That the Christ, Timotheus, Silvanus, Peter, Paul, Jesus, Apostle Grace taught. The Bible says in him there was no nay. But the Bible says in him was yeah. And we have to raise a generation that cannot give excuse for an underperformance. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want you to confess with your mouth and say, I believe all the promises of God. And I will see all the promises of God in this life. And repeat it to the devil and say, and I mean all. Oh. 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 I'm not going to live for him even one line. Uh uh. No. No. You're taking it all. You're deciding to live a victorious life. You will not bury your child. You will not bury your spouse. You will refuse it. You will not lose out. You will win. If it has happened before, you tell him, Devil, not this time I have you. And I'm going to make it to the end in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout, Amen. So I feel in my spirit that the church of Jesus is being pushed into a place of consecration in the mystery of faith where we are getting to a place where we don't have any excuse and that everything you say will work it will work we will work i said it will work i said it will work in the mighty name of jesus that you will be far from harm that your ears will not hear bad news it doesn't mean the attacks cannot come they can come they will come that's okay but on every attack there will not be any consequence on your life on your story on your testimony on your family on your children and everything you represent and you must believe it and shout amen that's our story that's what we believe Franero, we are believers that's why I always tell you, you are believers. Somebody shout hallelujah. Romans 10 verse 9 tells us, now we are delving into the understanding of this heart issue. How to believe with your heart, with your soul. Okay? Because to believe with your soul, it means that you refuse your thoughts to go against your confession. You refuse your emotions to go against your confession and what you know in God to be true. You refuse your feelings to go against your confession in God and what you know to be true. You refuse your desires, your endeavors, your purposes, not to go against what you have said and what you believe to be true. You cannot say, I believe that I'm healed, but you're talking like this. I suppose I believe I'm healed. Now pray, pray, I believe I'm healed. Now pray. You're shaking. Everything you're doing outside you is saying that you don't believe. I'm, I'm healed. Yes. I believe it. I'm healed. I believe it. I'm healed. I believe it. How can you believe when you're shaking? Stir in yourself the feeling of a healed person, even when you're not feeling healed. That's what I tell people. This is an example. If somebody is sick and they pray for you for divine healing, okay, and then you wait to feel okay, you will die. Are you hearing me? If your soul is stirred into feeling healed, your body might not be healed, but if your soul believes that you healed you act out the emotion of a healed person what do you do you get out of the bed of sickness 
You dress like a person who is healed. You go to work like a person who is healed. And if the pain increases, they ask you how you're feeling. You say, I've never felt much better. That is a person who refuses. But you have people. <laughs> when they fall sick, they white brackets over them. How is it their hearts? <laughs> They want to be hugged. I'll be sick. I'll be sick. Some of you, eh, they nurse you to death. Because the people you're around already are emotional. They're in the soulish realm. Bambi. You know, when we were growing up, we had a neighbor. She was an old lady. She was a grandmother. Whenever we were sick, when we were kids, yeah, she used to love us. She used to call me her husband, mommy. You know how old women call us mommy? I understand now like my grandmother who called me my husband or something like that it's an African thing really and so one time they told her that your husband is sick so she came to see her wife her husband and I was suffering from malaria I remember that time and this woman sits down and you know she started narrating things now I look back as I grew and I'm like you know people who when you fall sick they start giving examples of everybody who died of that sickness have you been around such people oh that is it this is the one which killed the other boy the other day. Munanga, the boy woke up and he was okay. But evening the boy was gone. Oh, sorry. You understand? <laughs> Your brain starts to give you all the ways you can die. You fear being alone in the bedroom because you'll die without your last words. You start following your people in the living room says that you die when they are seeing. Why? Because there are people who know how to narrate disease when you... you under, oh! Somebody say far from me. Yeah, but we have people like that. They're just so good at narrating issues. You tell them, ha, they fired me. Oh, I know someone who was fired exactly like you are. Do you know where he is? Ooh, the guy lost everything. He sold his house, went back to the village. His children became sick. His wife also became sick. Now the guy is in the village. He's surviving. He's asking. He's living on people's more money. He's actually digging. In fact, the last I heard, he's on some island. But he also lost a job like you. Then he also start now put everything they are doing. You remove the fellow and you put yourself there. You start playing thoughts of failure. Outside you say, I shall not fail. But inside your movies, eh? Do you know there are people here who have buried themselves like a million times? You've already imagined your funeral. You even know how your casket would look like. Some of you, the devil, has too much time with you. He can even tell you, imagine that you die now. Then you see all your friends who are crying. You understand everyone who is around you, then how they bury you. Then you snap out of it and say, yeah, hey, whew, far from me, far from me, devil. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> You have to fortify yourself to a place where you refuse. <laughs> Kenneth Hagen always said that you cannot refuse a bird from flying over your head, but you can refuse it from making a nest over your head. Hey, okay, if your thought comes, let it pass. One time I was watching a documentary of a, a fellow, Jacob Zuma's boy, okay? You remember the story in South Africa was against Jacob Zuma's boy and there was accusations on him that he had um, sort of uh, dealt with the wrong people in government and corruption and stuff and therefore monies were embezzled through him. And then so they put this interview of this young man and so they asked him and say, um, with the things that are on you, the cases that are leveled on you, levied on you and, and the courts that you're going to face, haven't you thought of the possibility of being taken to prison and arrested? And the young man said something. He said, you know what, when you say that statement, I saw it come and it just passed and went. It didn't stick in my head. So he said, what do you mean? He says, it just came and passed. It didn't stick in my head. I don't think I can be arrested. It's not in my head that I'll be arrested. I said, look at this guy. I loved him already. You know why? Because that is the mindset the Christian has to be. If the bad should come, let it just pass. But some of you, you build nests. You imagine the friends you'll make in prison who will be bringing your food, who you leave your accounts to. You're preparing your spirit. You're purifying and defiling your soul. And as you're doing so, you are creating for that reality and it shall surely come.
The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verses 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, confess with thy mouth the Lord. And I tell people, salvation is the confession of the Lordship of Christ, not just what Christ did. To say, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, I'm born again, it's not enough to believe that because Jesus died and rose again for your sins, it's enough for your salvation. The Bible says you must confess with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus. So when we are making people confess salvation, they have to confess the Lordship because even Satan knows that Jesus died and was rose again. There are many people who believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they have not received the Lordship. So it says, with the mouth, we confess the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says, and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. He said, thou shalt be saved. You see how salvation, sozo, comes? The Greek word there is sozo. You see how salvation comes? Salvation comes with the mouth confessing and the heart believing. Those two have to be married together. You don't confess what you don't believe. Those words are idle. Somebody shout hallelujah. The next verse says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Give me the amplified of that. It says, For with the heart a person believes, adheres to and trusts and relies on Christ. And so, the Bible says, is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. And the Bible says, and with the mouth, he confesses, declares openly, and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. That means the mouth is a confirmer, not an affirmer. The heart is the affirmer. The affirmation of your faith is in the heart. The confirmation of your faith is in your mouth. You confess to confirm. You don't confess to affirm. You affirm with your heart. You confess with your mouth. Your righteousness is given because of the affirmation of your heart. A man is declared right. The rightness of God, are you hearing me, is given by the affirmation of your heart. When your heart affirms something, you are right before God. When your heart believes something, it means you have the right to pray. It means you have the right to confess. In other words, the state of your heart gives you your right. He says, for with the heart, when the heart is affirmed, the Bible says, that man is acceptable to God. Do you know what that acceptance means? It means I have accepted you to ask for anything. I have allowed you to ask for anything. How do I allow you to ask for anything? I allow you to ask for anything because of the state of your heart. If your heart is polluted, it's corrupted, it's not right, it's not set apart and it's consecrated in the mystery of faith, it doesn't matter how great a confession you're making, you are wasting your time. You have no right to ask for certain stuff. You are not acceptable toward God because God's acceptance is based on the heart that affirms faith. With a heart a man believes. A man is made righteous with a heart. The rightness of God mantles your life because of the affirmation of your heart. When your heart believes, God mantles you with his rightness. So when you say, be healed in the spirit realm, you are right. I'm going to change my world in the spirit realm. God is saying, you are right. So when the Bible says all the promises in him are yeah, you know what that means? When a man's heart has believed and you say, next year we are growing deeper, Jesus says, yeah, next year we are walking higher, yeah, we are walking in the elevation of the spirit, Jesus says, yeah, we are increasing and multiplying, God says, yeah, there's a stamp of heaven, a seal of approval on the affirmation of your heart, your mouth is simply confirming. So that means the real McCoy, the real deep activity, it happens here. Some of you, you confess that your hearts are far. For the Bible says, for they worship me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. They worship me with their lips. Isaiah spoke it, but their heart is far from me. He called those hypocrites. He called that hypocrisy of the spirit. That's hypocrisy. And because you know everything happens here, that is why he tells you, he says, For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him, the Bible says, They shall not be put 
to shame. He has promised, if you learn how to work here, you will never be ashamed. You will never be ashamed. Let them laugh, but I want you to know they are laughing for a short while. Are you hearing me? Let them laugh at you as you're doing whatever you're doing, but I want them to know that they are laughing for a short while. Just work on your heart, beloved. Just work on your heart. They will see. They will see. One day they will see. Let me tell you, there was a time we looked so stupid to believe. But now the same people who thought we were joking, now they realize we are more serious than we actually appeared. Because much as we were speaking, what they understood, they never understood that our hearts were already prepared to believe God. And I am a believer. Somebody shout, I'm a believer. Say it again and say, I am a believer. Believe God. He has promised he will never put you to shame. What if you saw shame in the past? Dust it off and move on. I'm not good with narrating failed stories. I don't. If I prayed for two men and they've died, I don't even talk about it. If I prayed for three men and two died and one lived, I only testify that I prayed for one man and he lived. I don't talk about the two who died. I'm not good at narrating failure. I don't know how to narrate my past failure. Some of you are so good at narrating at everything that is not working in your life. Even when you come to us as pastors for prayer, you want to first narrate your story. And some people don't know that every time you're narrating what you're exactly going through, you are establishing it the more. Do you know that when you come for prayer requests and start narrating your bad story, you're establishing it the more? Some people, even the way they talk, it can cause hell to clap. Apostle, I went through too much. I even lost my job. Then hell is like, yeah. And then as though that was not enough, my husband left. And then this happened. Satan is clapping. No. That's why when you come to us for prayer requests, please, save us your story. Because some of you, you think that God is going to move based on the intensity of your problem. No. God does not move on the intensity of your problem. God moves on the intensity of your faith. The people you see healed on the crusades, they don't first tell us all their problems. Because God is not interested in men who narrate problems. Some people are problem commentaries. They know how to commentate problems. They speak them in chronicles like, you know, the football commentators. And then this happened. And then apostle, as though I can... And as though as that was not enough. I've not even yet begun. I'm coming. No, this is just the beginning. I'm still telling you. No, you come and tell me. Apostle, I'm thanking God for my education. Don't tell me how many people you've lost. How much money you've lost. No, you tell me I thank God for my education. That's the right way to pray. Somebody shout hallelujah. But some people are so good at narrating that even hell claps when they start talking. Far from you in Jesus' name. I said far from you in Jesus' name. You believe it? Say amen. And so he said, I will never let you ashamed. That's a promise. Because someone said, Apostle, I believed. I believed, but it did not work. That was not faith. Faith worked. Faith works. You understand what I'm saying? So, in Proverbs 4.23, that's why it tells you, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Guard it. What do I mean by guarding? Refuse to think negatively. Refuse to be emotional around negative stuff. Refuse to put feelings in what is not working. Some of you have ways of just sitting back and thinking about everything that doesn't work in your life. And then you hate everybody. And I want to pray for people whose souls are so dampened 
You know, when David told his soul, my soul, why hast thou downcast, why be disquieted in me? Some people's souls are so downcast. How do you know that you have a downcast soul when you wake up angry? Some people wake up so angry. That's a bad spirit. Your morning is supposed to be the happiest time of your life because joy cometh. Joy cometh. Joy cometh. Masses are new every morning. You are supposed to be happy. The life of Christianity is a very happy life. But do you know how many people wake up in the morning? Even if you greet them, they don't want to greet you. If you live that life, is evidence that there is a lot of stuff in your life that is not working and it's not working because it's not just working but it's not working because you have failed to lift your soul up above adversity the bible is very clear that a merry heart has a continual feast proverbs 15 15 he says all the days of the afflicted are evil but he that is of a merry heart has a continual feast in other words they have deliberately continuous results when you learn to have a happy heart you'll have continuous results it doesn't mean that things won't come they will come but refuse to be consumed by the evil of the day be happy you know people wake up and they're all sunken and silent you find them they are so annoyed they get so annoyed with situations that they even hate everybody around them and such people until they embrace the love of god they can never walk out of whatever is troubling them they have not yet understood what it means to embrace god that is why i tell people for example i don't believe in stuff like addictions that mean people are not addicted i know people are addicted to stuff but i only say addiction is ignorance if you are addicted to something, then you are ignorant of that thing. The Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What does the Amplified say? Sin shall not any longer exact dominion over you, since now you are not under the law as slaves, but are under grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. When you know how much favor is for you and how much mercy is available for you, sin cannot reign in your body. What a wonder. When you understand how much favor God has put on you, how much grace, how much mercy is on you, sin cannot dwell. A woman one time called me as a girl. She says, I want to see your apostle. Say she comes at the office and says, Apostle Grace, I've been living with a man who did not marry me. And that man had a wife already, has a second wife. And I've been living with him for so many years. But one day you preached the message of grace. She didn't say you condemned us. No, she said you preached the message of grace. And I understood how much God loves me. I packed my bags and I left the man's house. Do you know why she walked out of adultery and fornication? Because she needed grace to tell her her value. She just needed to know her value. Because there are women who think that without certain men they can't be. Wrong. You still have Jesus. And he married you before the fellow met you. So what do you mean? Are you hearing me? But somebody embraced the grace and favor. That's why we preach the grace message. Because the more favor is revealed to you and mercy, the more you walk out of sin effortlessly. Because favor and mercy comes with the power to take you out. You cannot be addicted when you understand grace. A lady came and told me, Apostle, me, I'm addicted to masturbation, I can't stop. I told her, no. Every morning just wake up and say, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Because it seems all these years you've been condemning yourself. She said, okay. She started confessing it. A couple of months later, she says, Apostle, I don't know why it went. And I said, I love it that way. Because when grace gets it out of your life, you don't even know when it left. You don't know when it left. You just notice that it left. And by the time you notice it left, it meant that you were noticing something higher than it. That means it was not the subject or object of your attention. There was something higher. The Bible says, for when my soul is overwhelmed, take me to a rock that is higher than I. Grace introduces you to a higher realm above any addiction you could ever have. And whether you want it or not, you'll wake up and just look at the bottle of beer and you no longer have its appetite. 
you look at a stick of weed and you no longer have its appetite. You look at the things that used to catch you and you even ask, what was going to kill me over this? Have you ever gone out of something and you're like, Kali, this thing could have even killed me. But now I'm out and I don't even know how I'm out. Grace. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout amen. Shout glory to God. Now the Bible says in Mark chapter 7 verses 18. He said, and he said unto them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man? He says, it cannot defile him. He says, are you so dumb? Are you so without understanding and spiritual perception to understand that nothing outside the man entering him can defile or will defile him? He says, it does not, nothing from without entering the man. You're not going to catch a flu because somebody sneezed it out. You're not going to get uh, this because somebody did this. No. But the Bible says in the next verse, it says, Because it entereth not into the heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. In other words, even if you take poison, it cannot kill you. But if it enters your heart that it's poison and it kills, you will die. Even if they give you water without poison and they say, we have poisoned you, you will die if you believe. It's like doctors know the placebo effect. They give someone a medicine that has no value at all, no nutrient at all, and they tell them, if you take this times two, you will heal. And they take the placebo and they are healed. Pharmaceuticals are trying now to ban placebos because they failed to explain the placebo effect. It has healed even the most incurable diseases. But for a man to be convinced that this will heal you, the body adjusts. Why? Because they told their heart that they will be okay. Some their trust is in doctors. And so when the doctor says, ah, this one, you'll be fine. Some people get the wrong diagnosis and die. But what has killed them? Because of words, negative words. The power of those words have entered into their hearts. Some people allow some words to enter their hearts. And when those words enter, listen, I met a man who had married a wife and they had four children over the years and told me he married his wife HIV positive. And the guy was negative. I said, so how do you guys keep yourselves? Because I believe in discordancy where couples can agree on how to keep themselves healthy. And the guy says, oh, no, there's nothing we do. And I told the guy, so how do you even manage? Not How? He told me, Apostle, it has never entered my heart that I can have HIV. Now, I'm not saying, some of you, you have very twisted brains. You think I'm telling you, God do stupid stuff because I'm saying so. No, you will die for nothing. Because some of you don't even have a quarter of that faith. But you think you do, but you don't. Your mind can lie to you, mental assent, and you think you have the faith. Yes, your chi heart is so dead and you don't even know it. So it is not something we recommend even as a ministry. Are you hearing me? But we are not also against it when someone says they have their faith. You understand what I'm saying? This fellow never got it because he was never conscious. It never entered his brain that he can have HIV. It has never entered. There are people who even without doing anything, their hearts already are open to HIV. Even without doing anything. And some it finds them even without doing anything. Does somebody understand what I'm saying? Because you opened your heart. He says it does not defile the man because it does not enter into their heart. In other words, whatever enters your heart defiles you. Whatever enters your heart, do what? Defiles you. That's why we say guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. Refuse to be insecure, refuse to fear, refuse to worry, refuse to do all that nonsense the world lives by. Refuse to open your heart to vulnerability and acceptation from men and people. Receive your acceptance from God. Know who you are. Guard your heart from the opinions of men. Do you know how many people live their lives by opinions? 
how many likes they have on YouTube, how many likes they have on Facebook, how many acceptations they need from men. Do you know how many times I've been to restaurants and I find girls doing like... They are taking photos. With my girls at... Know who you want, what's inside you. Know your value before God. But you're going for Miss What competitions. But they want to know who is Miss What. Let me tell you, when you know who you are, you don't need four judges to tell you you're beautiful. But Miss What, that's insecurity. You're insecure. You're convincing yourself and you want them to believe you. So they tell you, undress yourself, you undress. Fearfully. Yes. If they come to you and tell you, hey, but you have a figure of Miss Campbell, I tell them, I don't need judges to tell me. Because our kingdom is not of this world. Somebody shout hallelujah. You don't need to open your body for people to know you're beautiful. Because your beauty doesn't even begin here. It comes from within. Let the world, let the insecure do that. Go away, man, you know who you are. You don't need to compete with any woman to know who you are. You know your price. Yeah. The anointing has the ability to beautify everything. Pain. when you know how it works it's the power that beautifies even the most ugly things do you know I can buy a very old car and make it beautiful because I'm anointed I can get a very old phone and hold it for two weeks and everyone buys it because it's calopsia it's the anointing I'm the one who gives it beauty it doesn't give me beauty a time will come where you don't even need makeup because makeup won't make you more beautiful, no. You're the one that beautifies makeup. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. Calopsia are all over. You beautify things. No. Do I take selfies? But how many cameras are on me? How many cameras are on Apostle Grace? Thursday. What? Sunday. Guys are there. Chua, chua, chua. Tell them never let those things look for you. Tell them Kabikunonya, let them look for you. <laughs> Glory to God. People come, they find me in the street. Apostle, selfie, selfie, apostle. Selfie, everyone wants to take a photo with me. Let cameras look for you this year in the mighty name of Jesus. Let them look for you. Do you know how many people are running away from the things some of you are buying to take? People are switching lenses to take us deep nearer. Some of you are struggling with the phone settings. Rest in God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Never allow it to enter in your heart that you are less. Never. The world deserves to see you. The world deserves to read you as a book. You're a princess. You're a prince of God. You're fearfully and wonderfully mad. Hallelujah. There is nothing wrong with you. Nothing whatsoever. Don't ever put it in your heart. Don't ever put it in your heart. I'm perfect. Tell yourself, I'm perfect. Tell it, yeah. Somebody say, you're perfect. Even me. Yes, even you. You're perfect. Somebody said, hallelujah. So he says, it cannot defile the man because it does not enter the man. Verses 20 says, for that which cometh out of a man defileth the man for within out of that heart the hearts of men he says is where evil thoughts come from adultery fornication murders all of those things with theft some people have stolen without stealing physically covetousness wickedness deceit evil eyes blasphemy pride foolishness all of that nonsense begins from here they are farmer that's why he says if a man looks at a woman lustfully, in Matthew 5, he says that man has committed adultery. Because there are people who, who judge people because they're in social media. 
Simanya, they got this one with this one. Chua, can you believe Gundi was caught? But for you, whom they've not caught, you have probably acted more movies than the one they caught. That's why I tell people, <laughs> always be in the mirror. The, your mirrors should not be transparent. No. The, don't, don't live with mirrors which are transparent because you, you see people through them. No. You get mirrors that can only look at you and put, always put mirrors around you. You'll be fine. Because there are people who know how to judge others. Yet your brain is worse. Some people, if we unscrewed your nut right now and connected a VG port or an HDMI cable and put it on that screen. <laughs> Praise God. So he says, that's where this stuff all comes out. It comes from the heart. It comes from there. He says in James, for if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask for the God who gives liberally to all that ask without fault finding. And verse 6, the Amplified says, only it must be in faith uh, that you ask with no wavering, no hesitation, no doubting. For the one who wavers or hesitates or doubts is like the billowing surge out at sea and is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks from the Lord. For being as he is a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, he is unstable, unreliable, and uncertain about everything that he feels, he thinks, and desires. Such people cannot expect to receive anything from God. It doesn't matter how good a confession you are, if your heart is not perfect here in faith you are wasting time because that means you're double-minded your mouth is speaking contrary to what your heart feels and the Bible says because that is double-mindedness when your heart is double-minded when you are double-minded when your heart is opposed to your faith of mouth of confession and the Word of God it means that you are defiled in the spirit that's why in James 4 8 it says draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double-minded people that means when a heart is double-minded it's not pure it's defiled hearts are defiled because they're double-minded in other words what your heart thinks and your mind thinks if they are contrary to each other it means you are already defiled and if you're defiled the Bible says you need a cleansing somebody shout hallelujah and in Matthew chapter 5 the Amplified Bible verses 8 he says blessed happy enviably fortunate and spiritually prosperous somebody said hallelujah happy enviable fortunate and spiritually prosperous possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation listen the revelation of his grace regardless of their outward conditions the Bible says are the pure in heart he says for they shall see God exclamation mark meaning surely certainly did you understand that he said when you purify your heart when you affirm in your heart what your mouth speaks what the word of God says you will be happy men will envy you you'll be spiritually prosperous as possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation of his grace that revelation of God's grace is the conditioning of the mind and the spirit you condition yourself to the revelation of God's grace regardless of your outward conditions whether things are working outwardly or not if you keep that revelation of grace and experience of God's favor you will become spiritually prosperous men will envy you God will create spaces of your happiness because you're pure in your heart he says there is a guarantee you will see the Lord you will see the Lord reconcile your heart to the Word of God meaning refuse to think opposite refuse to be emotional contrary to the Word of God refuse to apply feelings contrary to the Word of God refuse to purpose contrary to the Word of God some people are praying for healing but they're preparing their dead for death how can you have healing when you're preparing for the worst? 
we'll pray for the best and prepare for the worst. That is not the faith. That is the world's teaching. You're different. Get to your feet. Is somebody blessed? Is somebody blessed? Are you blessed today? I want you to raise your voice and speak to your heart today. Tell it from today. You will believe God. Talk to your heart. Talk to your heart. Talk to your heart. Speak in tongues. Speak to your heart. Thank God for faith. Thank God for the affirmation of things in your spirit. Take a minute and just talk to God. Talk to God. Come on, open your mouth. If you have tongues, speak them. If you don't have tongues but can speak another language, speak it. Whatever you have to speak, speak. 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 Come on, speak. Tell your heart, never be downcast. Be strong in God. Tell your heart, hope in God. Speak in tongues, just speak in tongues. As your lips are speaking, something is happening in the spirit. If you don't have tongues, speak another language or your English, but say something. This is the atmosphere where you're going to tell your heart you will not fail. You will not falter. You will not draw back. You will not be weak. I am above and not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. I'm more than a conqueror. I refuse to look at my outward condition. I choose to look at my inward story. Life is coming, hope is coming, answers I hear, you have not failed, refuse to look at what is happening now, look at the God that is beyond your circumstance, for he is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above that which you dare to ask or think according to the working power that worketh in you, he is not dead yet done with you, all things are working for your good, because you love the Lord and you are called according to his purpose. Let them laugh, but only for a while. God is going to turn your story around, and they that were laughing will admire you. They will envy you. They will testify of the prosperity of your spirit and the happiness that is around you and your household. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I want you to give him a mighty hand of praise. Come on, celebrate Jesus today. Come on, celebrate Jesus today. Celebrate Jesus today. I want you to shout and say, I am a believer. And I don't fail. I have no excuse of failure. I know who is in me. I know who is working in me. He's working for my good. Hey, thank you, Lord. I decree that you have a good week, that you have a good month, that you have a good year, that your results are coming upward and upward on me, that there is no negative energy for you, that your ears will not hear bad news, that bad stories are not your testimony, that your history is erased by God, and your future is sure and firm. That what is going to happen in your life in the days to come is going to be bigger than those that came before you. God is going to do things in your life 
The Bible says, Sing, O barren woman, for the children of the barren are greater than the woman that had children before. It means God is going to do for you things in that area way bigger than those who entered there before you years before. I decree and I declare that you are in a season of redemption where God is going to renew your strength, He's going to renew your days, He's going to renew your joy, and He's going to give you victory, He's going to give you triumph in everything that you do. You will never fail, failure is not your story, for all the promises in Him are yeah, and in Him amen, to the glory of the Father. Give the Lord a man of praise. Thank you, Lord. Here and you've never given your life to Christ, repeat this one after me. Say, Jesus, I've heard your word today. I choose to believe that you died and rose again for me. Tonight, I receive as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.